Well, let's uh, pray before we turn to the Word of God. And now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in God's sight through Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, uh, are there any Pentecostalists inside the kirk today? Initially, you may think, well, if it's a fellowship of Pentecostalists that you're aiming for, you would need to be in the car and driving 30 to 50 miles east. Because should you do that, then you are probably guaranteed some tambourines and some flags and some reactions to the preaching, which is not merely in the head or in the heart, but probably manifested in the body. Those who are very happy and feel blessed will be rolling around in laughter, and those who feel troubled and oppressed will be rolling around making strange noises. And since there are no tambourines or flags being waved, or people shouting out, then you might initially conclude that the kirk here is devoid of a Pentecostalist believer. And what I want to show you from uh, the book of Acts chapter 2 is actually nothing should be further from the truth. This should be a gathering of Pentecostalist Christians. Because Acts 2 shows you and me the four signs of the Holy Spirit. And it's very simple. You just look at the four signs and you say, if these four signs are present, then surely the Spirit of God is present. Because, as I said to the children, you can't keep these four signs in your own strength. Biblically, we're told, if you try to keep any of these four with the gas in your boiler without reference to God, you'll fail. You'll absolutely fail. These are four marks that you need God's help for. Now, I know what you're maybe thinking at the outset. Edward, Isn't there only three? Isn't there only three signs of the Holy Spirit? Well, friends, there's actually more than four signs, but there's four in the passage we read. So let's uh, turn to Scripture, and we'll take verse 1, and let's consider the first sign, that God's Spirit's at work in you, whether you keep a tambourine or not. The first sign we might call obedience. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. There's a reference to a time frame and a reference to a venue. And the question you could ask in verse 1, very simple, how did they know to be there then? Why are they not all just at home, wearing their slippers, drinking their coffee, waiting for the service to be uploaded onto Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube? Why are they not doing that? Why have they bothered to gather at a place, at a time, physically? Well, of course, the answer is because that's what the Savior commanded. That's what Jesus said they were to do. You see that? He said, no, I don't want you going anywhere. I don't want you going to the four winds yet. I want you to go back to Jerusalem, and together, I want you to wait for the gift my Father will send upon you. Remember, the Pentecost day is not the entrance of the Holy Spirit into human history. It's just the entrance of the Holy Spirit in such a magnitude into the church's history But he was at work in these people before 
even that day. And the great thing is this, you cannot be obedient to anything God commands if you do not have a measure of God's Spirit helping you keep it. Because, friends, my spirit would just rather lie in bed after a week's work than get up. And for those of us who have got young families, we know how hard it is. Some of you are knocking your pan in six days in that week. And yet you still get up and get everybody fed, and everybody clothed, and whether it's sunny or lashing a rain, you come to the kirk. Obedience like that cannot be measured in human strength. It's impossible. You cannot keep the law if you don't have the spirit. So what you've got to ask yourself is, do I have a real desire to be obedient to what Jesus says? You know, do I really have a desire to do what he says ought to be done in order for a Christian life to be lived. Gathering for worship, sacrificing my money that I could just spend it on myself. But no, I want to give it because I believe there's souls in this world that would benefit from it. Where that obedience is present, though a tambourine is absent, you've just got the first mark of a Pentecostalist believer. Second sign, the power the Holy Spirit brings. Verse 2, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like, so it's not exactly this, but it's like this. It's like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. In the scripture, the wind of God, the breath of God, pneuma, we get the word pneumatic, pneumatics, pneumatic drill, air. It's what God breathes into Adam in order to elevate him from the rest of the animal kingdom. That Adam becomes an ensouled creature capable of transcendent thought. I love my cat, but my cat doesn't think about mortality, time, or eternity. He thinks about catching birds and mice and coming to us for food and sleeping on everybody else's bed. That's what he thinks about. He fashions no sanctuaries or any idols. He offers no prayers, and he's not anxious about his pending death. But we can be. Peter, remember, who did not have the strength or the power under the cover of darkness to say he knew Jesus to a slave girl, is the very same man that David read in the closing verse who stands up in broad daylight and tells a crowd about Jesus. Where did he get the power for that transformation? If not from heaven itself. Where would one get the power to face down the almost collapse of society as we know it? Where would one get the power to stand with hope when others are falling around you with despair? Now that power comes from the Spirit of God. When you will not be broken, but you'll remain strong. When you'll stay rational rather than becoming irrational like the masses. When you'll be honest with yourself and say, that needs repented of, that's just a sin. Well, I, I know everybody in Legacy Mediaville says it's, it's permitted, it's trendy, but it, it's a sin. Oh, that's going to cost you friends on Facebook. Still, it's just a sin. Where does that power come from? That power to take a stand comes from God. That power to hold your loved one comes from God. That power to stay faithful and loving, it, it comes from God. Have you known that power? even over these 14 months? Have you been driven to near distraction? Near distraction, but in the mercy of God, we are still here. You're still here. For those who can testify to the power and the obedience, though there are no flags being waved in here, the Holy Spirit is. Third, Mark, the fire the trust. 
and divided tongues as of fire, as of fire, doesn't mean it really was, it just looked like that, appeared to them and rested on each one. Fire's a trigger word. You know, in our culture, we have these trigger warnings. If you're watching um, maybe something like Faulty Towers, I think that probably carries a trigger warning because they talk about the war and he, he hits Manuel, who's a, a European national. That could be considered uh, not very funny by some people. There are many comedies that you maybe watched 10 years ago which carry trigger warnings. The, the modern mind believes them inappropriate, irrespective of age and nuance. And so you see that all these things get uh, changed. But when the fire comes upon these people, it's not negative. It's positive. The trigger for the fire for some people is, but it's judgment. It's judgment, it's negative. I'm fed up with that. That's why we don't come to the kirk. Because we've had all these ministers for centuries. Fire, 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 judgment, judgment, judgment. Well, I don't know if that's what they said from one week to the next or not. But in the Bible, fire is not always judgment. Fire is as creative as it is destructive. Fire is refining, purifying, in order to what? Something be trusted. You can trust gold if the person has refined it and it carries the stamp. It's genuine. So what are we being told by the fire landing on the apostles? That the apostles are perfect? (laughs) No. The apostles are imperfect, but the gospel's perfect. You can trust the message. You can put your hope in the message. You can trust that there is a God in heaven who's created this world. You can trust you do have a soul and you're not just a collection of atoms and electricity and biochemical processes. You can trust there is a day of justice when all the missiles that fire into people's houses for self-defense, apparently, they'll be called to account. Every single bloodshedder will be called to account. And where you can trust that, because it's from God's promise, though none of you are rolling around on the floor, making noises or seeing things, though that's absent, the Holy Spirit can still be present. So you've now got three signs. And the fourth one, and the final one, the languages which exhibits the love. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And then you get the geographical list of people from Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, and they're saying, how can we understand what these Galileans are saying? Because they've never learned their languages. Now, there's a miracle, isn't it? Now, some of us might say, "I, I think that's a miracle of speaking. Speaking a language you've not priorly learned. Uh, I've heard of that in missionary work. People being able to say things to people that they were unable to ever say they learned. But they said it, the person heard it, and their life was changed by it. It was a miracle of speech. Some of us might say maybe here was a miracle of listening. That if we heard it, we wouldn't know what they were saying, but God actually made it such that these others could receive it and know what he was saying. Possibly, yes. But it's a miracle either way. Whether it was a miracle of speaking a human language or of hearing one, it's a miracle. And my question is this. Why bother communicating with people if you didn't care a jot about them? People who are not cared about are usually forgotten about, aren't they? They're not reported on the news. People walk past them in the street. When you reach that stage of non-person, and sadly there are many people in our nation who almost fit that category, and certainly in other parts of the world, non-people, there's no attempt at communication. Does not communication suggest an interest? 
In fact, I'm saying it suggests more than an interest. It, it reveals an intense love. God wants them to hear because he loves them. As he loves them now. It can be hard, can't it, to love one another? Because though, by and large, we are, most of us, originally from this culture, we still find it hard to love one another. Husbands with wives, parents with children, children certainly with parents, brothers and sisters, that's a sore point. Parents die, siblings never again speak. It's hard. If loving one another was easy, we wouldn't need God's Holy Spirit to help us. But the Holy Spirit is poured out on this group of people to reveal God's intention. I love you. I want you to hear this message that will save your soul. And I want you to love one another. Peter doesn't preach this sermon to win an argument. He preaches a sermon to win a soul. And you know, I've told you so often, painfully in my history, I learned how to win arguments with those who were older than me. But I don't think until the very end I ever got an opportunity to win a soul. And let me tell you, when you know you're maybe winning a soul for Jesus, it's better than winning a thousand arguments. Have you felt that? Can you look at one another this morning and say, I love you. I want to love you more. I love him. I want to love him more. He loves me. I want to love those poor souls who are losing their houses. I even want to love those people who are trying to steal their houses with the defense of, but it's self-defense. We have to try with God's Spirit to love. If you can testify to that, if you can testify to the gift of love shown through the languages, the gift of trust shown through the fire, the gift of power shown through the wind, and the gift of obedience by keeping His commands and certainly by coming in here, then tambourines absent, flags absent, rolling around in a floor absent, Holy Spirit present. So the next time a minister says in a kirk, hey, imagine a minister in a kirk saying, who here is a Pentecostalist? A congregation in the Church of Scotland would be able to say, me, us, because happy birthday to us. Amen, and thanks be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, world without end.